now we will be discussing about the arches of the foot arches of foot are divided into two types the longitudinal as well as the transverse type and again they are subdivided the longitudinal is subdivided into medial longitudinal as well as lateral longitudinal arch and the transverse arches are again subdivided into anterior transverse arch as well as the posterior transverse arch so if you see here in this picture so the bones forming the longitudinal the medial longitudinal arch will be by these bones which are shaded here the calcaneus talus cubo uh, not the cuboid the navicular the three cuneiform medial intermediate as well as lateral cuneiform the first to third metacarpals metatarsals all this together will be forming the the medial longitudinal arch those bones which are unshaded will be forming the lateral arch which will be on the lateral side so this is the again the lateral part of the calcaneus the cuboid as well as the fourth and the fifth metatarsals so these are the arches uh, and these are the bones which are uh, contributing in the formation of these arches the transverse arch will be the anterior transverse arch as well as the posterior transverse arch that we'll see uh, when we discuss in with better pictures than this one okay before we discuss about the arches we should know what are the functions of the human foot first why we should have the human foot and why this type okay one thing is it supports the weight of the body these uh, human foods are specialized to support the the weight of the body the whole weight of the body will be uh, going uh, from from the uh, upper part of the body the all the weight will be um, actually uh, bared by these uh, lower limbs and especially the bones of the foot second is it serves as a lever to propel the body forwards during locomotion when you see the shape of the foot we'll discuss again in detail about the shape of the foot this shape will actually help in propelling or throwing of the body in the front during walking so this is uh, called as the uh, the lever to propel so it acts as a lever to propel the body forwards to move forwards how this is by this small series of small bones here which are present within the foot uh these why should we have these small bones why don't we have a single large bone a single bone which can uh, uh, actually do this function okay why should we have this small bone that should be the question so these small bones actually help the foot to adapt itself to move on uneven surface imagine a flat bone big bone and you if you are walking on uneven surface how do you adapt it will not adapt okay but if you imagine these small bones there are so many multiple bones here and they are arranged in such a fashion and such in an arch that when you keep it on any uneven surface especially during olden times when we did not have slippers or shoe and the person was supposed to walk on the uh, rough surface and they have to climb mountains and other thing they had to adapt their foot according to the shape of the bow, uh, the uh, the surface over there so uh, this shape of the uh, foot as well as the bones of the foot will very well adapt to different surfaces and even surfaces and it helps in gripping the surface and putting the body weight on it the second is the form it the small bones help in the formation of arch the single large bone it cannot form a arch so these small bones will multiple small bones will form arches if you can see here this is the medial longitudinal arch which is can be seen from the medial side and this is the smaller lateral longitudinal arch which can be seen from the lateral side now we should uh, know what are the functions of this arch why we should have the arches okay one thing is the first one will be it acts as a springboard you know springboard springboard uh, is usually you know, the swimmers they know when they are supposed to dive they go on a flat uh, uh, jumping surface uh, wooden uh, uh, flat uh, extension which uh, will act as a propelling uh, structure from where they will Um, uh, actually get the movement to jump and they dive into the uh, the uh, swimming pool 
so this uh, is called as the springboard so similarly uh, this foot the shape of the foot acts this arches of the foot acts as a springboard they give uh, the initial movement to the foot and to jump or move or propel your body forward so it acts as a springboard the second is it acts as a shock absorber if you see here these bones there are so many multiple bones and whenever you jump from a height if it is a flat um, single bone when you jump on it the whole body uh, pressure will be transferred the weight everything will be transferred to the single bone and it it cracks crack open but because of the small bones when you jump from a height they all uh, actually they absorb the shock and uh, they slightly move and adjust themselves accordingly and they uh, disperse the whole of the body weight in different parts so these uh, the shape of these arches as well as the small bones will help actually as shock absorber the third is proportional distribution of the body weight even if you are standing on uh, any one surface or somewhere uh, it has to be transmitted the weight of this body will be transmitted equally on different parts and there will be proportional distribution of the body weight and so there is no pressure on single uh, part of the foot the fourth is it acts as the segmented lever we'll talk about this segmented lever later uh, when we'll discuss the, the each arch okay the fifth is protection of the plantar vessels and nerves these arches actually so they gave space here so that any structure can be safely uh, uh, can be uh, safely hide here so the nerves especially the plantar vessels and nerves will be passing through here and if it is a flat bone then again if you are walking on uneven surface on sharp objects or something like that they will press and they will injure the structures but because of this arch they are much more safely preserved here inside this arch and here we have the muscles as well as tendons as well as the plantar aponeurosis which you have already seen so all this will give additional support so this idea this uh, arching of the foot will help actually protect the, the plantar vessels nerves and other structures within the sole of the foot and the fifth uh, or the sixth is the shift of weight distribution if there is any shift of the weight distribution it will be equally distributed again as i said uh, in the proportional distribution of body weight and then it helps actually the foot uh, to bear the weight okay so these are some of the functions of the archer it acts as a springboard the second it acts as a shock absorber the third is proportional distribution of body weight fourth is segmented lever fifth is protection of plantar vessels and nerves and sixth is shift of uh, weight distribution okay now we'll discuss uh, the factors responsible for maintenance of these arches we'll discuss this in general right now and later we'll discuss for each specific uh, arch okay one is the shape and arrangement of the bones if you see here the shape of these bones is very peculiar as well as the arrangement but these peculiar shape bones as well as their arrangement actually helps in the formation of the arch okay so these bones actually their different shapes and sizes as well as uh, arrangement helps uh, the arch to be present there the second is intersegmental ties or ligaments and muscles if you see here in the sole there are so many muscles as well as there are ligaments as well as even the, the tendons all these will actually help as intersegmental ties or ligaments uh, within the foot and which again helps the maintenance of the arches we'll discuss more in detail about this uh, when we come to each arch third is it acts as a tie beam or bowstring if you see here in the arches later we'll see where there will be tie beams or there are strings which will be preventing the arch from collapse okay and fourth is there are also slings which are coming the muscles which are in the leg they come here and they form a sling and they will be pulling the arch upwards so that it can be maintained as a arch so these are some of the uh, factors which help in uh, in the maintenance of the arches in general when we come to again in detail about each arch then at that time we will discuss them again uh, in much better way 
okay in this picture if you can see here these are the structures which will be actually touching the floor when you take an impression of the foot only you can see the heel the ball of the little toe as well as the ball of the great toe so these are the three structures which will be uh, touching the floor so it means that the other parts are actually are they are above the the uh, uh, the surface the level of the surface okay and even sometimes you can see the balls of the the other three toes here okay but in a smaller fashion but the main thing will be the heel which is formed by the calcaneum the ball of the great toe as well as the ball of the the little toe that which are the heads of the metatarsals coming to the the first one which is most important is the medial longitudinal arch okay if you understand this arch then you can understand the lateral arch much easily okay so the first one is the medial longitudinal arch as the name indicates it is medially placed so it is on the medial side near the great toe and it is longitudinal arch it is from anterior to posteriorly so this is called as medial longitudinal arch it is represents the big arch of a small sucker actually this is the biggest arch in the foot so it is very prominent so it is big arch of a small circle if you continue this arch it will form a small circle so this is the big arch of a small circle what are the bones forming this arch it is as i we have already discussed the bones which are on the medial side especially the medial part of the calcaneus the talus the navicular bone the three cuneiforms the medial intermediate as well as lateral cuneiform as well as the first second and third metatarsal bone these will be the bones which will be forming the medial longitudinal arch what is the summit or the highest point in this arch that is formed by the the talus high and formed by the trochlear upper surface of the talus if you see here this is the talus so this is the highest point of this arch that form the summit then what is the pillar what is the posterior pillar okay so whenever there is a arch so there should be two points which will be touching ground so the posterior pillar is formed by the medial tubercle of the calcaneus so this is the calcaneus bone here so the medial tubercle of the calcaneus will form the uh, which will be touch, actually touching the floor so that will form the posterior pillar what is the anterior pillar it is formed by the heads of these three metatarsal bone the first second and third metatarsal bones heads will be forming the the anterior pillar what is the function of this arch as we have already discussed the in general about all the arches the functions along with that this the main function of this arch will be it acts as a shock absorber that is the main function whenever you jump from height so this is the main arch which is important responsible for the absorption of all the shock and prevents from fractures and other things what is the characteristics feature of this medial longitudinal arch it is more resilient because of the more bones and joints because there are more bones here as well as because there are more bones so there should be more joints between these bones so that's why this joint jo actually arch is much more resilient compared to the other arches because there are lesser bones as well as lesser joints so what are the factors which maintain the medial longitudinal arch we had discussed these in general now will be specific the shape of the bones shape of the bone especially the talus in this okay so they are wedge shape the talus at the center acts as the key bone or the key stone so if you see the arch whenever you see a arch so there will be one a uh, stone which is most important that will be called as the keystone so this will be the keystone and if you remove this keystone the whole arch will come down collapsing so it is, that is that uh, such a important stone which is the main stone that will be called as the keystone okay similarly we have the key stone here which is actually the key bone which will be the talus bone here in case of the the medial longitudinal arch if you have seen the picture before so this arch is especially uh, stabilized by the talus if you remove the talus the whole uh, arch will come collapsing down so that's why this is called as the the keystone uh, or the key bone of this arch the second is the intersegmental ties which acts as the metal staple if you see this arch between the two bones these two bones are fixed by something called as the metal staples if you know the staples 
which pin uh, which will be pinning the paper they will all keep the all the bundle of papers together similarly the staples will keep the uh, the uh, the stones together similarly we have in case of the foot we also have metal staple these will be the the ligaments especially the plantar ligaments like the plantar calcaneo navicular or it is also called as the the spring ligament if you can see here this is a small ligament but very important ligament this is called as the calcaneo navicular ligament which is in the, on the plantar surface and this is called as the spring ligament which is a very important uh, ligament which acts as the metal staple in case of the the medial longitudinal arch the third factor is uh, factors acting as the tie beams so which are the factors which will be acting as the tie beam especially the medial side of the plantar aponeurosis which will be acting as the the tie beam <coughs> if you remember the plantar aponeurosis it will be connecting the uh, the uh, the calcaneus behind and anteriorly it will be going to the five digits and they will be connecting so this acts as a tie beam if you see here in this arch so this arch the two ends or the two pillars are tied together so that they don't uh, grow uh, apart from each other and hold if these two uh, ends will go apart then this arch again comes comes down collapsing so to prevent that they will be always the two ends will be always tied together so this is called as the tie beam so in case of the foot the plantar aponeurosis especially the medial side of it for the medial arch it will be the medial part of the plantar aponeurosis which acts as the tie beam the muscles of the first layer of the sole also act as the tie beam the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus this also acts as the if you can see here in this this is the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus which is actually coming from the 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 posterior compartment of leg and it will be pulling and get inserted to the the distal phalanx the base of the distal phalanx so whenever it contract it will pull it backwards and it keeps the arch as it is so this also acts as the tie beam as well as the medial plantar part of the flexor deuterum longus as well as the flexor hallucis brevis all these will be helping and acts as the tie beam for this arch that is the part which will be keeping the two ends the two ends of this arch together and uh, they prevent the collapse of the the arch here you can see here in this picture they have shown you the the plantar aponeurosis which is connecting uh, the calcaneus behind to the anteriorly to the phalanges actually and it will be uh, it cannot be stretched it cannot be pulled up because it is an just an aponeurosis but it will be holding the two ends of the two pillars of this arch together so that's why this is very very important one along with that you can see the other muscles as well as tendons which are present here flexor deuterum brevis and other things which keep the arch together here also you can see the plantar aponeurosis which is uh, holding the calcaneus as well as to the the metatarsals as well as the phalanges together and this will keep the arch in its position so if it breaks then it might come down if there is other if the even this other uh, uh, tie beams are removed okay so all these are important structures which will be keeping the uh, the arch in its position here you can see here this is the uh, the spring ligament the plantar calcaneocular ligament which is the spring ligament which we have already discussed before okay in the intersegmental tires which acts as the metal staple now going to the fourth uh, uh, factor which is responsible for the maintenance of the arch is the suspending the arch from above which acts as a sling the tendon of the tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior will be actually acts as the the slings and hold the arch in its position the uh, the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus has been shown here as well as the other tendons like the the uh, the tendon of the tibialis posterior here 
as well as the uh, the tendon of the tibialis anterior which will be inserted to the medial side tibialis anterior coming from the anterior compartment of leg and tibialis posterior coming from the posterior compartment of the leg both will be coming towards the uh, the medial side and pull it upwards and they acts as a sling if you can see here so this is the uh, tibialis anterior here as well as the tibialis posterior both are coming down and they will pull the uh, the arch upwards on the medial side so the acts as a sling so this is how a bridge is suspended this is the arch here in this uh, and this is suspended from above this is called as a sling similarly here the tibialis anterior and posterior will be actually acts as the sling and they will hold the arch uh, in its position so all these are the four factors which are responsible for maintenance of the medial longitudinal arch now coming to the lateral longitudinal arch so this lateral longitudinal arch as the name indicates it's on the lateral side as well as it is longitudinally placed okay so this is the lateral longitudinal arch this is a much smaller arch compared to the medial longitudinal arch it is a small arch of a big circle so if you continue it uh, as a circle then it becomes a very big circle so this becomes a small arch of a big circle summit what is the summit the highest point low and lies at the subtalar joint so below the talus there is a septalar joint so that will be uh, the summit of this uh, lateral longitudinal arch what are the bones forming that will be the calcaneus bone you can see here this is the calcaneus has shown here then we have the cuboid bone here we have the cuboid bone here we have the cuboid bone and the two metatarsal the fourth and the fifth metatarsal these are the four bones which will be forming the lateral longitudinal arch the number of bones are lesser here as well as the joints because of the lesser bones lesser joints here okay compared to the the medial longitudinal arch what is the posterior pillar again it is by the calcaneus but it is by the lateral tuber in case of the medial longitudinal it will be the medial tubercle here because it is the lateral longitudinal arch this is formed by the the lateral tubercle of the calcaneus anterior pillar by the fourth and fifth heads of the metatarsals heads of the fourth and fifth metatarsal will be forming the anterior pillars what is the most venerable part it will be the calcaneo cuboid joint so here is the calcaneo cuboid joint that is the most venerable part that is more prone for damage what is the characteristic it is more rigid compared to the lateral uh, medial longitudinal arch as i said medial longitudinal arch is much more resilient because of more bones and more joints this has less more uh, joints as well as less bone so it is more rigid because of less joints as well as the bones function what is the function main function apart from the general function especially it will be helping in transmitting weight and thrust to the ground whenever you jump from a height it helps in the equal distribution of the transmission of the weight as well as whenever uh, the thrust is on the ground it prevents from collapse so what are the factors which maintain this lateral longitudinal arch again going to the first one that is the shape of the bones again the bones are wedge shape here especially the calcaneal angle of the cuboid bone is a very important uh, shape of the bone which maintains the lateral longitudinal arch what is the intersegmental tiers here that is the long and short plantar ligaments here if you can see here again uh, in the medial longitudinal arch it was the calcaneal navicular ligament here in case of the lateral one it will be the short as well as the long plantar ligaments which acts as the intersegmental tiers but that is the metal staples here also you can see the long plantar arch as well as the short plantar arch which maintain this again the lateral longitudinal arch factors acting as type beams especially the plantar aponeurosis here the lateral part of the plantar aponeurosis along with the muscles of the first layer of the sole flexor deltorum longus tendon as well as the flexor deity minima brevis that will be the uh, structures which uh, acts as a tie beam especially the plantar aponeurosis as we have seen already plantar aponeurosis how it acts as a tie beam especially the lateral part the muscles of the first layer of the sole especially the lateral muscles of the first layer of the sole flexor deltorum longus as well as the flexor deity minima brevis all this will be helping in uh, act which uh, in the maintenance of the lateral longitudinal arch 
by acting as tie beams and the sling acting from above the tendon of the peroneus longus brevius and tertius there it was the tibialis anterior and posterior in case of the medial longitudinal arch in case of the lateral arch it will be the tendon of the peroneus longus brevius as well as the tertius or fibularis longus brevius and tertius so here you can see here this is the fibularis longus brevius and tertius will be the anterior compartment all this will be if you can see here they will be arching and they will be going towards the lateral side so whenever they act they act as a sling if you can see here this is the sling okay especially the fibularis longus going all the way from the lateral side to the medial side going to the the first medial cuneiform as well the first metatarsal so it acts as a sling especially the, the peroneus longus that's what has, has been shown here so these tendons will be acting especially the peroneus longus along with the brevis and tertius or which is also called as the fibularis longus brevis and tertius act as the the slings acting from above here also they have shown you the peroneus longus which is from lateral side arching all the way toward the medial side and this is the peroneus brevis going to the the fifth metatarsal both will be pulling the lateral side of this arch upwards so these factors will uh, also help in the maintenance of the lateral longitudinal arch now coming to the the two transverse arches anterior transverse arch and the posterior transverse arch if you can see here this is how it is formed so so these are the arches from medial to lateral side which is in the front and the back this will be forming the anterior and posterior transfer how it is formed we'll let's discuss the first uh, is the anterior transfer arch anterior transfer arch is a complete arch so it will be a complete arch which is formed by the the heads of the five metatarsals so it will form a complete arch but the posterior arch is not complete it is incomplete and it is completed by the other foot so only half of the dome will be completed uh, by this arch and the other uh, half of the arch will be completed by the the other foot so the two foots are joined together at that time only uh, when you join the two feet together only at that time you can form the complete arch if not when there is only one foot it will be only one half so that is the difference between the anterior arch and posterior anterior arch will be completely formed okay because the two ends will be touching the ground but in case of the posterior transverse arch it is incomplete only half of the lateral side will be touching the ground the medial side will be above so when you join the other foot together at that time it will form the complete arch the second is uh, difference between these two arches is the bones forming these arches for the anterior transverse arch it will be the near the heads of the five metatarsals we have seen when you join the heads of metatarsals and keep it on the floor only the first and the fifth will be touching the ground when you take the impression you already seen the impressions when you take it is only the first uh, head as well as the, the the head of the fifth metatarsal as well as the heel which will be touching the floor so it means the first uh, head as well as the fifth head will be touching all the Third, second, third, and fourth will be above the ground. So they will be forming the arch, and the first and the second, fifth will be forming the the pillars. But in case of the the posterior transverse arch, it is formed the bones forming will be the greater part of the tarsus, uh, tarsus as well as the metatarsals. So it will be mainly by the the tarsal bones. So those tarsal bones will not be only the lateral side of the tarsal bones will be touching, but the medial side it will be much more above. So they don't touch on the medial side. So only when you join the other foot, so again it will be completed by the other side. So this is the second difference between the anterior and posterior tarsal chart. The third is the first and fifth metatarsal bones come in contact with the ground. As I said, the first and the fifth, these are the heads of you imagine, these are the heads of the five metatarsal. Only the first and the fifth will touch the ground almost. The second, third, and fourth will be high above. Okay, but in case of the uh, the uh, the posterior transverse arch, only the base of the fifth metatarsal will touch the ground. Only the fifth metatarsal will touch the ground all other metatarsals as well as the especially the tarsal bones will not be touching the ground 
okay so so this will form only the half of the doom so these are the some of the differences between the anterior transverse arch and the posterior transverse arch anterior transverse arch is anterior place and it is complete arch posterior transverse arch is posterior place and it is incomplete arch which is completed by the other foot the anterior arch has uh, is formed by the bones that is the heads of the five metatarsal bones uh, the posterior uh, transverse arch is formed by the especially by the tarsal bones as well as some contribution from the, the posterior part of the metatarsal bones the third difference is the first and fifth metatarsal bones come in contact with the ground so they will form the two pillars and it forms a complete arch but in case of the posterior transverse arch only the fifth uh, base of the fifth metatarsal will touch the ground all other metatarsal as well as the tarsal bones will not touch the ground so it will have only one pillar so it forms incomplete arch so these are some of the differences between the anterior transverse arch as well as the posterior transverse arch now discussing what are the factors maintaining these transverse arches of the foot again coming back to the shape of the bones they are typically wedge shape these are the same bones forming so it has to be they are typically wedge shape uh, especially of the three cuneiforms and base of the middle three metatarsals these uh, shape of the bones of this cuneiform as well as the basis of the metal now it is not the heads but the basis of the metatarsal especially for the posterior transverse arch uh, will be helping in this maintaining of this transverse arch the second is the intersegmental tires especially these intersegmental tires are formed by the deep transverse ligament other plantar ligaments adductor hallucis muscles all these factors will be uh, acting as the intersegmental tires the tie beams or the tendon of the peroneus longus brevis as well as the tibialis posterior will be uh, maintaining the transverse arch uh, the slings acting from above will be from the peroneus tertius brevis uh, peroneus tertius as well as brevis on the lateral side and tibialis anterior on the medial side these are some of the factors which will be maintaining the uh, the transverse arch here you can see here the peroneus longus on the lateral side and here you can see the tibialis anterior and posterior so these on either side will be holding the, the transverse arch uh, in its position especially that peroneus tertius and the brevis on the lateral side which is present on the lateral side as well as the tibialis anterior which is present on the medial side if you can see here the tibialis anterior come go deep down and goes all the way towards the lateral side so these all these factors will be helping in the maintenance of the the uh, the transverse such so this acts as a sling so the tibialis anterior and it will be pulling the the medial side of it so that it doesn't touch the ground so these are some of the factors which will be maintaining the transverse arch of the foot now coming to the last part that is the applied aspects related to the the arches of the foot as well as the foot itself the first one is the pes cavus what is this exaggeration of the longitudinal arch if you have the normal arch it is good, fine and good normal but if it is exaggerated then it is called as the pes cavus and it is just opposite to that is the pes planus where it is flat foot if you can see here if you take an impression of the foot th this is the normal one where you can see the normal foot with especially the impression from the ball of the head of the first and the fifth metatarsal as well as the heel and some impression light impression about the other part of the foot in case of the the flat foot this whole foot will be giving the impression so because the whole foot the arch has come down and it is almost touching the whole of the floor so that's why that is called as the flat foot here if you can see here this is the picture showing the heel the ball of the little toe and the great toe which is supposed to give the impression but in case of the flat foot the whole of the foot will come down and it touch the ground because there is no arch now or very small arch and this will be the print when you take the footprint of this uh, pes uh, cavus uh, pes planus pes cavus is the just the opposite it is the high arch foot very high arch foot the third condition is the claw foot claw foot just like the claw hand 
the claw foot will, can be there because of the the uh, the damage to the the anterior compartment the nerve supplying the the anterior compartment of the leg which is the nerve supplying the anterior compartment of leg it is the it is the anterior tpl nerve or the deep it is also called as the the deep peroneal nerve so that is the which will be supplying the anterior compartment of leg and if there is damage to that it will be paralyze all the muscles of the anterior compartment of leg paralyze and they don't have any action on the the uh, the actually uh, the foot uh, on the digits of the foot and the muscles of the posterior compartment of leg will be acting mainly and that will pull all the digits of the toes and that will make it a claw foot so and also the muscles of the the, the small intrinsic muscles of the foot also uh, actually lead to uh, the claw foot the fourth is the club foot club foot is uh, such a one which is again due to multiple types but uh, it is called as the talipus equinus talipus calcaneus talipus varus talipus vulgus and the most commonest is the talipus equinus varus which is the commonest one where the foot is totally medially uh, rotated medially so there is actually the inversion of the foot and you can see the total inversion of the foot especially in case of the newborns that is called as the talipus equinus varus sometimes the foot is averted outside then it is called as the talipus valgus so if it is just uh, rotated media then it is called as the talipus varus so these are some of the different conditions which together it is called as the club foot especially this is seen in case this usually it is genital uh, congenital and you can see it is congenital uh, abnormality which you can see and the commonest will be the talipus equinus varus and the fifth applied aspect is something called as the march fracture especially when you march especially is the soldiers when they march okay they will be putting a lot of pressure on the foot and this can lead to fracture of some of the bones in the uh, foot and whenever there is fracture of these bones this is called as the march foot then there is a condition called as the hallucis valgus if you have seen the valgus is the the aversion okay and the hallux means the great toe great toe is sometime averted outside okay that condition is called as the hallus valgus okay so these are some of the conditions which are related to foot and the seventh one is called something called as the hammer toe in case of the claw foot all the digits are uh, actually uh, flexed and whenever uh, the uh, uh, this is called as uh, the the claw foot sometimes there is uh, actually uh, uh, hyper extension at the uh, metacarpophalangeal joint metatarsophalangeal joint and the flexion at the interphalangeal joint but sometimes the uh, the distal interphalangeal joints will be extended so at that time the toes will be averted and they will be directed forwards so it looks like a hammer so this is called as the hammer toe so these are some of the conditions which uh, we are supposed to know and we have discussed the arches of the foot the arches of the foot are divided into two types medial longitudinal arch as well as the lateral longitudinal arch these are the longitudinal arches and the second type is the transverse arch which is divided into anterior transverse arch as well as the posterior transverse arch and the we have discussed uh, what is the importance of the arches and what are the factors in, in general and again when we discuss each arch we discuss what are the exact factors the four factors which are responsible uh, for the maintenance of the arch and finally we have discussed the applied aspects related to this topic so this was all about the the arches of the foot as well as the foot itself so if you have any doubts, you can write back to me and I will try to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much.